let us shift our attention around a little bit. And what we're going to shift it to is the whole idea of doing this estimating and the quantity takeoff. And I want you to sort of think about that a little bit, about really what we're trying to do. Because I'm going to go ahead and sort of distinguish a quantity takeoff from an estimate. And sort of a very important distinction in there that's sort of important for you to get. Okay. The idea is we're all sitting back over here, if this is time, and we're working with this model, this <coughs> model which contains all sorts of different elements in it. And the first step in really heading towards an estimate is just doing an accurate quantity takeoff. So this is all about just accurate quantities. Now the truth is, as we go through and create an estimate, getting accurate quantities hasn't always been an easy task. It's often been sort of a very hard task because when I give you that roll of 30 sheets of paper and say, take off everything, you have to, in your own mind, do all the measuring and tabulating and seeing what you did take off and didn't take off. It's actually quite, quite hard. So what has happened in the past is this whole idea about taking off the accurate quantities was both very cumbersome it really was an awful lot of work. People pulled the hair out over doing this because it was really a very hard task. It was also very error prone. Because, like, like we do with our schoolwork, we often save our estimating for the last minute. And in those last few nights, as you're trying to pull it all together and running out of time, you know, it's entirely possible you miss entire segments. Or you might even double count entire segments of what goes on. So it was quite easy to come up with errors on the quantity takeoff side. Okay. In fact, there's sort of an irony to the whole thing in that people who are really good quantity takeoff people rarely get jobs. And the problem is, if you're really, really good at taking off all the quantities, you'll be very, very thorough. And the problem is, exactly, Pedro, who's not so thorough over here, he left out a few things. Okay, so his number is going to look better than mine because he's not even counting some things. He'll get the job, and what will happen is, you know, three months from now when we figure out what he left out, we're going to get into this big finger pointing match about with all the lawyers involved about why he left that out and why it wasn't clearly shown on the drawings and how he's really entitled to a change order and to get some extra money and yeah. You know, so there's this sad irony that people who are really really thorough don't win jobs. The whole idea of quantity takeoff is we should try to normalize that part out. We should be able to get accurate quantities out of a model. And that's something that's, it's not strategically your business advantage in terms of, yeah, it's really, there is an absolute number of a quantity based on a model. And really, at some level, we're getting to the point where a project team can be giving you a file that says, here are the quantities. That here is the model, you can pull the quantities out, and you're not going to sort of lose it with variability on this one. The next step is where the business advantage kind of comes in, and that's once we take the quantities, there's this whole issue about applying cost to those quantities and coming up with an estimate. And that's where every company is a little bit different. If I have a special proprietary method that's much more efficient or I have a way of doing things that cost much less, okay, I might come up with a very, um, very different number than you do for the same quantity. Okay, and that's really where the business strategy and the advantage sort of comes in. So there's this next step where we go through and we prepare different types of estimates. And let's think about what we can do. We can take those quantities and we can come up with something called a conceptual estimate. We can come up with something called a preliminary estimate. We can come up with something that I'll call a detailed construction estimate. Okay, And it's really just an issue of how much detail and how accurate the thing's going to be. Conceptually, even at its earliest point, we can often use some very high-level metrics to figure out how much something is likely to cost. For example, if you told me at a real, this rough sense, I want to build a house here in Palo Alto, okay, and I want to have 3,000 square feet in that house, I'd say, great. Probably cost, oh, let's say $250 a square foot to build a house here in Palo Alto. That house is going to cost you around $750,000. 250, did I get right? Three? No. Three, six, yeah, 750. Okay, beautiful. Have to do my math. Check it twice. Exactly. Okay. 
And you can say, oh, but 750, that's so much more than I want to spend. What am I going to do? And I say, well, you can't build 3,000 square feet in Palo Alto. At some level, there really is something at that high level where we can just sort of say there is an overall number based on the type of facility and where <coughs> you're going to locate it. I can give you a really rough number. It's better than zero. You know something there, okay? but it's not very accurate. So you come back to me and say, oh, OK, well, OK. Let's go a little more finely about this. I want to build it, but the house, I'll be very economical. I don't need the granite countertops and the hardwood floors. So I'm going to build a house, an economical house. So super. OK. So you are going to go ahead and give me a square footage, and you can give me a type. OK. But you're going to say it's variation A of that type. So OK. Well, for the economical house, maybe I can get it done for $150 a square foot. OK. So multiply it all. Okay, so that house may be four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. The average, okay, would have been seven hundred and fifty. Okay. If you tell me that now, you know, I need the granite countertops, the hardwood floors, the home automation system, and all the finest finishes. Okay, that may be three hundred, three hundred fifty dollars a square foot. Okay. So really easily, I can get myself up to nine fifty, a million dollars. But really, by giving me a very little bit of information. Okay, you can get me to different numbers. Okay, and really, the accuracy of the number I'm going to give you is really dependent on how good a job we sort of do with specifying the type. Okay, so at a high level, we can do conceptual estimating. And if you have a lot of experience, you can actually come very, very close this way. If I'm a builder and I build an awful lot of houses in Palo Alto, I could take you through three or four different houses that we've built. And when you say, yes, this is the one. This is, I want it just like this one. Okay, I can look back at my historical data and not even detailing every last doorknob and bathtub and faucet and things like that. I can give you a pretty good close idea of where that house is actually going to come up to. And that's what I'd call a conceptual estimate. Okay. And it's next level, okay, we can go through and do something we would call a preliminary estimate. And for a preliminary estimate, the way we usually approach it's a little finer. We'll say that, okay, given this design, there is really, uh, there's so many square foot of hardwood floor. There's so many square feet of concrete on, s or concrete slab on grade. There's so many square feet of stucco wall. Maybe there's so many windows. We'll, we'll sort of quantify it, break it into a series of metrics. It's still not going to be counting every bolt and nail and doing everything in fine detail. But we'll come up with maybe 50 different categories that are really what we think are the most meaningful categories. And we'll think about the quantities for those categories and associate costs with them. Okay? And that's really where we want to come through in terms of uh, this, what we're thinking about for this assignment. We want to think that there are things like there are walls, and there's different types of walls. Okay? And within those different types, we're going to take a square footage times a unit rate. Okay. And we'll come up with an overall guesstimate for that type of wall. We'll do that for the major assemblies, but it's really going to be these square footages by unit rates. And this is, with this whole notion of the unit rates, where a little finesse is involved because how you break up the project often depends on what sort of data you have available in terms of unit rates. So as you go through and think about what you're going to do, okay, it's helpful to kind of, if you're going to be using a cost guidebook, to look at how it's organizing things and then see if you can organize your data in the same format so you can sort of get some parallelism between what's going on. So we're going to illustrate that concept today, really, how we can go ahead and just get the quantities, sort of associate some things together by different types, then apply some rates to those types, and really quickly get at a number. Later on in the whole process, we get the whole thing of detailed construction. At that level, we not only just think about it as a wall, a certain number of square feet. We'll break the wall down into all the individual components. It has a certain amount of framing lumber in the wall. It has a certain amount of plywood on the wall. It has a certain amount of stucco on the wall. And for each of those different items, we'll think about the labor required and the materials cost and what sort of equipment's going to be involved and do we get to subcontract this out. And you know, you can really get down to the nth degree of trying to understand all the detail. And when we're doing a detailed construction estimate, we need to do that. Okay? But you don't need to do that for just getting this ballpark figure. Okay? So understand there's different levels. It's all driven out of the same quantities. Okay? But 
What we're going to do for our preliminary estimates, not as complicated as what you can do for the detailed one. Yeah? But um, in the preliminary and conceptual, conceptual, we still have this, we're still taking into account all of the things that are in the details. I mean, right? Yeah. It's not like just ignoring that, oh, you have to strip these things out. No. And really, what will happen is in the unit rates, what will happen is the unit rate that we're going to use will try to aggregate all those different things together. So you can sort of say, like at some level, if I'm looking at tile floors, okay, the tile might be $10 a square foot. The installation costs might be oh, like $3 a square foot. You know, there's different costs in there. But I can probably roll all that together and say, you know, for an installed tile floor, it's about $18 a square foot. And that'll include the materials, you know, just everything that's involved in the whole process. So we try to aggregate it at that higher level. Okay, make sense? Beauty. Okay, let us go ahead and show you how that's actually applied. And how we're going to do that is we're going to go on back over to the PC side of things. And on the PC side, we're going to take a look at that model and we're going to export it in a form that we want to use to a program called Autodesk Quantity Takeoff, which is one of the tools that's available for doing this. There's some other tools. If you're in the 241 class right now, some people are using Vico in the suite of tools. Are some people using Tecla? No, most people are using Vika. Building Explorer? OK. There's several different tools for doing this, but they all sort of work on the same fundamental idea that you take a building model, we pull out quantities, and we apply some formulas to the quantities to try and work them into costs. OK. I'll work with Autodesk Quantity Takeoff. We have it installed here on these machines. It's also up on the Scythe machines. OK. OK. Then Try working down here, because we have fresh installs here. We also have available to you, if you would like to download this and put it on your own machine, go to CEE server, CE 110 apps, which you know is the K drive. Do you have licenses? No. Nah. Well, actually, I take that back. We at Stanford have like 60 licenses to it, okay, which we can ha let you borrow okay, and install that way. If you go through and just install it and use the magic serial code 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 all those zeros, it'll give you 30 days anyway, okay, which buys us some time before we have to worry about the licenses. But if you want to keep on working with this in a continuing way through the year, come talk to me and I'll show you how you borrow a license. Because we do have them, and they're just sort of sitting there going to waste right now. OK, so we have a lot of licenses for all that stuff. OK, and we can help you install that on your own machines. Okay, um, bah, bah, bah. or you can use it whenever you're connected to the network license server. Okay, if you happen to install it on your own machine, I'll send out some mail about this, but just let me warn you about this. If you are a Windows 7 or a Vista user, which a lot of your machines are, there's one special file we have to copy over and put into your installation. Okay, so it's all decide, it's designed for XP. But I'll send out some mail about where you find that and what you have to do. So just if you are a Windows 7 or XP user, or X7 7 or Vista user, yeah, yeah. remember to look for something or uh, a mail from me that's going to say what to do with that before you actually try to install it. OK. Let's go ahead and show you what we're going to do. The idea is that we're going to start out over here in our Revit model. And for this one, I'm actually going to just use the model that we're going to be working with especially as part of the, pro part of the project. because. Unlike the structural and the you know, building performance analysis, you know, quantity takeoff is a fairly certain and straightforward thing. You'll, you'll see that yeah, I can even sort of go work with a model that has this much complexity in it, and I can predict what the results are going to be, or I can understand what the results are. So I'll just go ahead and work with this one so you can sort of see how you can get a start on the project if you want to. Okay, What we're going to do is it's going to start in Revit with the model, and we are going to export this model. So. How do we export it? We come on over to the Export tab. And unlike GBXML, which we used last time, <coughs> we're going to export it as a DWF file. What? DWF? That's the file format I used to print this out and turn it in on coursework. Well, it turns out that same file format has all the information we need to go ahead and do the quantity takeoff. And as you're doing that, you could just export this 3D view. That will give you the full 3D model. But it's actually helpful to include all the different views. That way, you can go and look at your model from several different perspectives, make sure you have the objects grabbed. So what I'm going to do is actually just under this menu, choose In Session View Set. And then I can go through and choose Get All the Views and Sheets and check them all. Okay. 
There's really not a lot of difference there. It means that the DWF file is going to contain all the 2D views as opposed to the 3D view, but the same data is coming through. But I like to get all those sheets because then I can look at things in floor plan and elevation views as in addition to the 3D view. Let me say export to those things. I will go through and send that out to my L drive folder. I'll make it the class 2 export. I'll put them all together into a single file, which keeps the TAs happy. Okay, and it'll go through and now just export all those different views, creating a big old DWF file. Okay, so so far this looks very much like doing the uh, GBXML export. You just choose the right format, you get it into that format, and you send it on out. Okay, let, let it finish. I think it's done. Just about. There we go. Let me kind of shrink that down. Come on in. That's fine. If you want to take a look at that file, we could open it in quantity, take off into what we're going to do. But actually, if you just want to share that file with anyone, DWF's a fantastic format. Let me show you what's in there. I'm just going to open it in Design Review, which is a freebie program anyone can get to. Design Review lets anyone go ahead and take a look at these DWF files. It's very much like Acrobat Reader. The nice thing about DWF files versus Acrobat files, though, is that Acrobat files, PDFs, only have lines that don't have any intelligence. The DWF file actually understands all the building objects okay, and lets you interrogate them and work with them. And that's why we use it as our format for getting things across. See what's happening here. I swear I got that. No views available. That's not very good. Make sure there's some data in that file. Looks like there is. Let's try again. OK. Here's the actual model file. And the model files here, as well as there's all sorts of other views kind of floating around in here. Oh, let me go ahead and I can list the different views, like the elevations and the floor plans and things like that. So I can look at it in any of those views. Those are different views that were sort of available in there. We can look at them this way. If I go back to the model, though, oh, hang on. I'm very bad at navigating around in here. Let's go back to the 3D view. Here's the model file. I can orbit around and do whatever I want to. Let me come back now to the model. That's the thumbnails, markup. Let me pull that over. OK, I want to get back to the model, and I'm having trouble finding it. So I'll find it here in just a second. Because I can select these items. Oh, there it is. You, what do you do? Let's put that over here. Oh, there it is. OK. This tool baffles me a lot of times. OK, let's go ahead and show you how this works. I can orbit around, for example. And if I choose the model, OK, if you choose an element in the model, we can actually sort of see what element it is over here in the list. If I choose an element in the list, it'll actually sort of highlight it in the model. Well, of course, you can't see it right now. It's that wall right there. OK, and we can also go ahead and take a look at the properties. I can say object properties. And you'll see that all the different object properties, the instance properties and the type properties we're used to are here. What level it is, what level it goes to, what the height is, what the area is, what the length is. All this information has been hiding out here all along. It's just really object element data. Okay? And you can look at it this way <coughs> within Autodesk Designer View. Or we can go ahead and pull this same hierarchy, the same list of all the different model objects into quantity takeoff and use those quantities to actually do our quantity takeoff. Okay. So that's what we're going to do now. Instead of just looking at them over here, let me ex or exit this one. And instead, we'll go into Autodesk quantity takeoff and take a look there instead. OK, let me just run the project. 
So I didn't bother activating it when we were installing it this morning. Let me say new project. And it starts here. We go ahead and give our project a new name and store it somewhere. I'm going to go through and say that it is a class 2 estimate and put it on one of my folders in the L drive. I'll say next to that. We get to choose which system of units we're going to work and what kind of currency we're going to work with. And I'll say US dollars and imperial units are fine. Say next to that. We next get to go ahead and choose a catalog. And let me, for this one, I'm just going to choose Uniformat. Let me talk about what catalogs are. Catalogs are actually, what is it? It's structures that you set up that really map the different types of elements to specific rules about how to compute the costs, okay, as well as some assumptions about what the costs are going to be. So what's going to happen is the Uniform Format Catalog is just sort of a generic catalog of different types. Um, in fact, we don't even have to bring that one in. I could just say none. That's going to be fine, too. But what's going to happen in as you continue to work is you'll start to develop your own catalog of the way you like to organize your projects, objects, and what sort of rules you use to compute what the costs are, and uh, you know just what the quantities, how they should all be aggregated together. So I'm going to say none for now, based on sort of what I did last time. I think none might be a better choice. Okay, we are going to go through and add drawing models. I'll go ahead and get that class too. Say import that. And I'll say finish. So again, going back to that catalog thing, for the first time since it's brand new, I haven't really set up a structure yet, I'll just say none. Next time, when I come on back and I want to analyze another model, if I'd like to use the same rules and the same hierarchy that I'm going to set up this time, I would choose my catalog. I'm going to bring it across that way. Okay. What it's going to do now is do a little unpacking. It's going to open that DWF file and see if it can go through and just make some sense out of all those different elements. Okay, I will close this window. Let it bring up its version of the model. There we go. Let's take a look at what's hanging out in that here. We have a model tab. The model tab is actually going to go through and show me here is the 3D model. So there it is hanging out. That looks very much like it did over in Revit. That's just the 3D section box view. Okay. And over here on the side, we actually have all the different all, all, uh, model categories. So I can, for example, choose under ceilings. I can choose some of the two by two ceilings. And if I go ch clicking on different elements, I'm not sure if you can see that. Maybe I need to zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that's just searching. That's not what I want to do. I want to zoom. I'll go back to my model. And you'll see what happens as I go clicking on different things. There one went yellow. You see that one? You'll see that all the different items in the model can highlight, and we can sort of see which model elements they are. Our task is really going to be to take all these different elements and take them off. We want to grab them out of this structure, and we want to put them into a different structure, a structure where we can go through and assign the different costs and our assumptions about how much each of these things should be uh, estimated as costing. So we can do that in a number of different ways. Where we're going to take them is from this model view to something called the takeoff view. Okay, and the takeoff view you'll see right now is empty. But what we're going to do is build up a list, a hierarchy of all the different elements and associate each of the different model objects with a specific category within a specific group okay, over in the takeoff. And slowly but surely, we'll add things in and kind of like uh, just build up what our cost assumptions are going to be. So let's show you what that looks like. If, for example, well, let me start with something very easy. Let's go to the doors, for example. And I'll start with just, oh, the glass doors, these doors that are sitting out in the hallway. Okay. So I could take a look at them. I can choose them all. You can sort of see them highlighting in yellow there, right there. If I choose them as an entire group, okay, and I say, and I right click on this, I can say take off. 
or I can take off to an item. If I say take off to item, you'll see there's really no hierarchy set up there just yet. Let me go back to the model. I'll just say take off. What it's going to do is copy those 20 objects out of the model and put them into the takeoff. Let's go over and take a look where they went to. Okay. So we have 36 by 20 doors. We have all the individual doors. Okay. We ought to be in pretty good shape now. That's the starting point. We're just pulling objects across. Okay. Having pulled those objects across, we could go back to the model and we could say, great, we got all those. Let me just hide them. I can right click those and hide them. And that way they're just missing from the model now. So we can start keeping track of, and it's a very good idea, keep track of what you pulled across and hide things that you've already pulled across so you don't take it off again. Okay. Similarly, I can go ahead and let's take a look at, oh, what's another kind of door? Let's go for the uh, single flush doors. Those are some utility room doors, things like that. They don't have a glass panel in them. I'll pull those across. I'll take it and take it off. Okay. <coughs> Close that. <coughs> 12 items, items came across. Let me go ahead and hide those so I don't have to look at them again. Okay, let's go back over to our takeoff and take a look there. So we have these different types. Now, just having a big old list of the different types gets a little unwieldy pretty quickly. So we can set up in this different groups and subgroups and things to help organize these things. So I can create a section, oh, I'll just create a group, I'll call it doors. And I can pull those things down into the doors category. Or I can even within that create a finer level of hierarchy. I can say that I want to have interior doors. And then pull things down into that hierarchy versus exterior doors. Okay, so I have 32 interior doors of these two different types. And we're just slowly but surely building up. It's really our catalog, or it's our structure of how we want to think about that data. Yeah, Ryan. Um, why is it undefined? I can't remember the count or type. Yeah, let's talk about that. It's actually a property. I think it came because we did, did, did you choose, pardon me, did you choose uniformat? No. No worries, but no. let's see how you fix it. What you're going to do is basically just over in the takeoff window, Okay, choose the grouping that has like all of them. Okay. Right click and say properties. Okay, and then you can choose how it would actually make sense to count, account for these things. Okay, what Ryan's asking about is sort of a very important property. As we pull all these different objects across, we have the choice, do we go through and are they things we just count? Like doors are a good thing that we typically just count. Because if I want to say that door is $1,000, I'll count one door, two doors, three doors, four doors. I'm just going to count them up based on the number. Okay, And a lot of things we do, we do that way. Some things we do linearly. For example, oh, if we were going to do handrails or something like that, I don't want to count it as a single handrail. What I want to think about is how many linear feet of handrail we have. Because the cost will really be driven by just how long that is. Some things like floors and walls, those tend to be driven by area, okay, by how many square feet, at least at this preliminary stage. When I'm going to go through and pull up some numbers based on square footage costs of the walls okay, by area, some things might even be driven, driven by volume. Things like, oh, concrete. If I'm pouring a gigantic concrete block, okay, it's really based more than anything on how many cubic yards of concrete are there. So every different thing we pull across, we're going to associate something with some sort of category to it, okay? whether it's something that's counted, linear, area, or volume. If it's undefined, okay, what that means is even though the element is there in the model, we're just pretty much ignoring it from a cost standpoint. Okay? So that just excludes it from the uh, takeoff. Okay. Let us go ahead. Let's stop right there for just a minute. Because we could go ahead and keep on pulling these things across one at a time and building up exactly the hierarchy we want. But when we come back from break in five minutes, I'll show you a much quicker way to do that where we can get the whole model across all at once.